like to introduce a not an old colleague of mine, I would say that it used to be a colleague of mine some years ago. And um, it's Marianne Drunsen from uh, the Norwegian Center for E-Health Research. She's going to tell us about video care, decentralized psychiatric emergency care through video conferencing. The floor is yours, Marianne. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. First, thank you for inviting me. It's really nice to be here and hear all these interesting presentations. Uh, so, my project is not about child and adult science. It's about uh, adult patients. But I have been working a lot with other projects using e-health for children and youth, so I think uh, this knowledge from this project, it's a lot of the same that have been presented earlier today. Yes, the video care project is about using video, uh, uh, video conference consultations between patient, uh, psychiatrist and other health personnel, often a nurse. So it's about the patient and the nurse is together, and the psychiatrist is at video conference at distance. Uh, this is, was an interdisciplinary research project. Uh, so we started in 2012 and finalized about 2016, but the last article from the project came this January. Uh, it was a collaboration between this old telemedicine center and a department south at the earlier name was General Psychiatry Clinic at the University Hospital of North Norway. This is not the same department and the same clinic now, but I will use this name because that was the start of the project. And it was this department that started the implementation project that we followed in this research project. And it was based on the first Norwegian video conference service in psychiatry emergencies. Uh, and it was started in 2011. And together with me, I had a really good research group. It was my colleague, Stanley Bolle, he is a medical doctor, and I had the, depart the head of the department, Gary Van Stelsland, he was a psychiatrist, and I had a professor in sociology at the University of Trondheim, Oxitura. And we also had uh, two really good professors in our re reference group, which we discussed a lot with under the project. And I think that all you know, there is, have been a lot of research on telepsychiatry or using video or video conference in uh, psychiatry. But mostly the research and the projects have been on planet consultations. And that's not the same as in emergency situations. In planned consultations, there's a lot of research saying this is successful. It's increased access to therapy, reduced travel needs, uh, and also you have better confidence in follow-up uh, patients after uh, admissions at hospitals. But emergencies are different. It's characterized by complexity, it's need for urgent action. Often you have limited information, people don't know each other. It has to be another organization around emergencies. And it's not, it should, we were asking, should we use video conference in emergencies or is it okay? And how can it function? First, some word about this department. They was responsible for all specialist psychiatric services in 22 municipalities in Troms, which is really many municipalities, also over long distances. They had one acute hospital ward in Tromsø, but they also had three regional psychiatry centers in Harstad, Narvik, and Sivsa. Each of the RPCs have outpatient clinics, but they also have a psychiatric ward with 12 beds, and also an ambulatory psychiatric team, 
which I can go home to the, to the patients or to the GP office and so on. And they're also responsible for all the emergency services in mental health. And these RPCs are far away from Tunsa, up to four hours away by car. And of course they had some challenges. So many municipalities over so long distances. And as we know, in many areas in the north, there was lack of psychiatrists, especially during emergencies, in the evening, in the nights, in the weekends. So they want the aim was to ensure better treatment to all patients 24-7 and much nearer where people are living. They also want to reduce unnecessary compulsory admissions and also unnecessary admissions to the central hospital in Tromsø because often they were taking my car four hours maybe in a police car, a taxi where you don't know the driver or maybe by ambulance and maybe it was not necessary to be in Tromsø, maybe they could get uh, the same or better treatment locally. So it was started the Devavi project and a lot of people here have been involved in this project because it was very early, it was in 2011. And they started with sex psychiatrists was going in an on-call system that was accessible by telephone but also video conference 24-7 for support to the, uh, the health personnel of the RPC. At the same time, we also strengthen this ambulant team, more resources, more staff, longer opening time. And we're trying to make one door in to each of the RPCs by uh, our own call service. And one of the goals was also that people can, could be admitted 24-7 the whole week. Because earlier it was not so, so easy to be admitted to a local hospital Friday evening. Because you know there are no psychiatrists there before Monday. So this service was also that people can be sick on Saturday or in the night. They could also get help 24-7. And it was also this goal to reduce admissions to the central hospital. <coughs> So this research project is about this service, but it's all, only about this video conference part of the service. But we also did a big evaluation. I will say just some few words at the end of the presentation, but it was really not, I will concentrate on the research project. And what was the aim of the study? We haven't did that before. Nobody had did that in Norway. So we were asking, how does the video conferencing matter in psychiatric emergencies. What do the patients think? What are the experiences of the health professionals, both on the RPCs, but also the psychiatrists on the video conference? And how will this uh, challenge or experience, uh, uh, how will it increase the collaboration and will it be some kind of the organizational changes because of this new service. Because it was a new service, we used an explorative design. We used qualitative methods. We did 29 semi-structured interviews with five, five patients, five psychiatrists in the on call system, and also 19 health professionals at each of the three RPCs. And all the patients had been participated in minimum one VC consultation. But of course, many of the health professionals have uh, attended uh, a lot more. We have four publications from the project. The first one is a protocol article. The three others is about the findings from the study. And the last one is a more sociological, is written in a more sociological framework. And then some word about the findings. The first question was, is it useful? Will people use it? 
and how will they use it, and to what will they use it. And in this article, we find that, yes, they use it. Uh, and in which situations? And they use it in four ways. It was a situation where it was uncertainty to find out the degree of the illness or the level of treatment. Is it enough to have treatment in our outpatient clinic or should we have it admitted on the hospital or maybe send it to Tromsø? Or what is the situation? Often it's complex and it's not so easy and they use the VC to discuss with the psychiatrist and the patients together. And it would also use, when, when it was needed to clarify, the severity of the patient's conditions. And there are also situations which were difficult, not because it was not uncertainty about the degree or the severity, but it was difficult or challenging to build an alliance with the patient, which is necessary to have a good treatment uh, for the best for the patient. And then they also used the video conference to have maybe a second opinion from the psychiatrist or be uh, several uh, around the patients and could collaborate with the patients about what to do. And often, I think you know, there can be very many people around a patient and different services, maybe the GP, maybe a psychologist, maybe and the family, or maybe just an on call in a doctor on the emergency center, which don't know the patients. And you have the RPC. So sometimes people are not uh, agree what could be the best, best decision. Sometimes there are some uh, you have to clarify it better, and they use the, the VC to have the psychiatrist together to, to uh, try to, to solve disagreements. And sometimes not the patient and the, the health personnel at the RPC also have to discuss uh, together with the psychiatrist to find the best solution. However, so they used it in complex situations and challenging situations. But still, telephone was used for the straightforward situations. When it was not necessary to use the VC, uh, they could uh, take up a quicker solution. In the second article, we discussed the confidence. Both the patients and the health personnel, and both the nurses and the psychiatrists, it was very uh, it was a finding that everyone was talking about trust and feeling confidence in the situations and using the VC. So we call this video confidence. And the term was uh, divided in four parts. Because they used the video uh, conference, the patient was much more involved. And by this, both the patients and the health professionals find more trust and confidence because everyone was together in this uh, conversation and the consultation of the patients. The second point was they could use this uncertainty, which I've talked about. Uh, because the patient was there, could speak for themselves, or the psychiatrist could see the patient if the patient was not so was too sick to talk. He could see the behavior and uh, the body language and so on. And also, for both the, the nurses and the psychiatrists, it was important, in, especially in complex and difficult cases, to share the responsibility. For example, for patients that had uh, done a suicide attempt and so on. Uh, but the final uh, findings was also that when it was not used, it also had a function as a safety net because they knew they could use it if they needed it. It just gives some quotes. As one psychiatrist said, I am more certain with a decision 
I might not make otherwise without having seen the patient. Seeing the patient through VC is something different than receiving a story told by others. And the nurse said, for me, this is all about shared responsibility. VC gives me the opportunity to discuss my concerns. The patient may participate in the discussion and then decisions can be made. So, the all three was, uh, was uh, had the consultation together. Especially the nurses working in nights and weekends and evenings say, it's so important for me that knowing I can call the psychiatrist and we can use the VC if I need it. Because in the, in the weekend we are uh, it's fewer stuff on the on the job and it, it can be difficult. And then you have this second opinion, this trust in the background as a safe net. And once the character said, the availability of VC is almost as important as the actual use of VC. It gives us all a degree of confidence. We can just use it if we need it. I think that's an important thing to have, that we have this in, as a safety net. And the last article uh, is discussing this video-mediated case in a sociological framework. I will not say so much about it, but uh, we were discussing. It's interesting because very often in uh, patient doctors uh, or patient nurses, there are only two people in this conversation in the medical encounter. But here is three. It's a triadic uh, interaction between three people. Uh, and this changes some of the social dynamics in these uh, emergency encounters. And we divide it in two aspects. There are some pragmatic aspects of using video conference. They can use it because they, uh, then you can use it to get immediately assessment of the patient. It's quicker. You can uh, call each other and then have the patients and they make a decision. But it's also important that both the psychiatrists and the nurses and the patients said it's important because it increased the transparency. Everyone heard what everyone said. Everyone can see each other. And then makes another uh, framework than if the Psychiatrists and the nurses go into another room, calling each other, take a discussion on the telephone, then go back to the patient and say what was said. Here is the patients together with them. I think that's an important thing. And the patients, for the patient, it has also a symbolic aspect. Because when they was together in the consultation with the psychiatrist, they had a, the sense of access to the real expert. And also in another way, the VC fostering uh, the patient a voice in the therapeutic decisions. So the symbolic aspects of this mediated case is also important because it's about patient involvement and taking the patient uh, perspective, uh, yeah, respecting that. And I think this is a solution that made a more patient-centered service, which is a goal in all uh, strategies uh, we are talking about the patient's health services. And two examples of that. A patient said, I am here to get help, you know, and I trust them to send me to someone who knows what he's doing. Hence, there is no problem tr trusting that. The doctor was very professional. That is something you don't notice. I respect the doctor's position and then I regard it. What he said has worth its weight in gold. Of course, this was maybe the uh, one way to see it, but of course, the psychiatrist, uh, he has a lot of power to, to uh, decide what is going on. Uh, the decisions on the treatment, the medicine, uh, admissions and so on. Of course, it was uh, important to meet this guy or 
the women that take these decisions. And another of the symbolic aspects was fostering the patient a voice. The two patients said, if the nurses call the psychiatrist, I cannot participate in the conversation. I don't know what they are talking about. And they will be kind of making a decision without me being there to answer and defend myself. You got to participate yourself and take part in discussion about what is actually going to happen to yourself. And this is obvious for all people I think it's good to bring your own voice into decisions about your health. So from a patient perspective, it was important to participate and being involved. They find it, it the VC safety, trust and feeling that they were taken seriously. And they also felt it reassuring to see the psychiatrists that actually take the decisions. And as we have heard earlier today, they felt less frightened to speak with the psychiatrist on the screen and not sitting in the same room. Because often they had never met this person before. And then it was easier to sit in the room with the nurse they had already talked with when they came there. <coughs> and of course, they could save traveling, waiting time. And it was less burden for them condition and many of them had maybe traveled hours before they came to the RPC and maybe sitting uh, for several hours on the GP office or other uh, health services before they came to the video conference. So, but of course there were some barriers. It's much easier to take a phone call. And it's difficult to change this kind of routines. And I think using the telephone, it's much more taken for granted. So we, uh, sometimes they said, oh, we could have used VC, but I forgot that. So, uh, but this was early when they used it, in the early phase of the implementation of the VC. But it could have been used much more than it was used. Uh, another barrier, it was not suitable for all kinds of patients, but for many of them. Uh, and sometimes, in most cases, the health pro professionals at the RPC, it, they found it straightforward situation, they, it was enough to just take a, a quick call to the psychiatrist, and they could handle it without using the VC. And in this project, the VC was in studios. It was not uh, on a PC or, uh, or using an uh, iPad and so on. So the ambulance team and the patient was not always at the same house as the VC room. Uh, for some health professionals, it was uncertain in how to use the technical equipment. I think that's important to have in mind because if you don't use it so often, you have to think it's and in an emergency situation, you have to use it uh, naturally, not thinking. And it takes time to change and incorporate new practices. And it takes much more time than we would like to. But I think time, time, time is very important and also make everyone uh, feeling that they are comfortable with the technical technology. Just some word about the evaluation. This evaluation uh, report came in 2015, I think, and it's both in English and Norwegian. So if people want to just send me an email, and the um, yeah, here is have also been with this, and it's a big evaluation with a lot of different methods we used. I just want to show you one thing. Because we also use a lot of statistics that data. And we find from 2011 and to 2014, it, it was a change in the pattern of emissions. You can see the red one is going down the central hospital. The green one is the RPCs is going up. It means that the total admissions at the central hospital reduced by 31 percent 
and the admission at the local hospital, the RPCs, increased by 24%. And it was a total redu reduction of days in hospital, uh, totally. And the needs for transport of patients to Tromsø were substantially reduced. And it was much more admissions also in the evening and the weekends and the nights. And one thing of that was because of the safety net. Because the health professional said, okay, we were thinking, we can try, because we know, okay, it's Friday evening, but we have the psychiatrist on call, we have it on phone, we have it on EC. If it's not the right decision, we can call him in two hours and then try again and take a new decisions. So the, the safety net was a good thing to, to have a lower threshold to help people on 24 seven. And another part of this uh, evaluation, we had focus group with both patients and family caregivers. They had really positive experiences. Uh, they are really uh, appreciated to have treatment nearby the patients' homes and the families and have experiences that this mental health service had a lower threshold, it was flexible and quickly available. And they felt they were being taken seriously. And they also felt that because it was a lower threshold and flexible, then it was a safety net for them. And maybe they, because they know they could call maybe the ambulance team or uh, having a VC with the psychiatrist, they could wait maybe one day more or two days more and maybe they don't was in this crisis because they have their safety net but that the, the mental health services was available for that. So to the conclusion. Video conference is useful for challenging situations and also complex situations. And it makes confidence both for the patients, the nurses, and the psychiatrists. The VC solutions improved collaboration and teamwork between the psychiatrists in another city and the RPCs. And it functions as a safety net. And I think frequent use is not always necessarily a success criteria. Also, to have a thing available is also maybe a success criteria. Uh, but the most important, the VC service strengthened the patient's participation and involvement in decisions about their own mental health. Uh, but there is a much more potential for more use of VC. And it's also important to say that uh, the department did, as I said in the start, a lot of things to make a more program better service. So the VC is only one part of this. So we, in the evaluation, we, we uh, highlight a lot of things that they have, we have done that make this uh, good, uh, good experiences. So we conclude that VC is a suitable tool for ensuring high quality, decentralized psychiatry emergency services nearby where people are living. So, Care over distance. Well, we need maybe also physical meeting, um, so we can drink in coffee together and chattering. But uh, it's a lot of good care you can do by distance too. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Naomi, for a very interesting presentation of, of um, the new services. I don't know how much fine documentation you find all over the world, but uh, I think that the uh, radio conference system used in emergency care must be the litmus test. Litmus test in Poselsky about how good a system is, or the life expectancy of a, of a uh, 
services um, based on using new technology. So very interesting to, to hear the results. Any, any comments from the US? I'm just giving thumbs up. Thumbs up is also... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, we know which in, um, compare with the Americans, uh, the Americans uh, always ask questions, whatever. And which in, he always asks questions when he knows the answer. I don't, don't know if I know the answer, but uh, um, this kind of services uh, must uh, encounter a lot of organizational barriers. Could you tell us something? Have you been, been developing a, a schedule for the use of, of these services? Can you call whenever you want? 24 hour, 24 7? Probably you mentioned it already. Uh, I don't know how it is in uh, the clinic today because it's another organizational uh, 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 clinic structure. But I uh, think they use it still. It's not true. Yeah, it yeah. still works. Yeah. yeah, it still works. And I think they use it more than when we, in the beginning. Uh, so. Uh, I think it was it was a very good thing because this department have a lot of uh, it was working very good with to get all the stuff with them in the changes and uh, including them and have uh, discussions and have workshops and I think that's a very good idea to if you want to have a big organization with you on the changes you want to have it's uh, important to have meeting. And it's about the involvement that also for the health professionals to have yes. them together and discuss how we can do it and why we should do it and what we think about these changes. And uh, that's uh, credit to, to the, the head of the part, department, I think, and also all the health professionals and psychiatrists that uh, was, uh, wanted to, to, uh, to participate in this project. And, uh, Yes. And also share their experiences. Yeah. Can I just ask about the legal responsibilities? Who, who's who's responsible for decision making when there are two clinicians at either end of a video conference and and the patient? In this uh, situation, it's the psychiatrist who has. Uh, he is on or she on call, and of the RPCs, there are uh, nurses. So I think the psychiatrists have the, the last word because uh, they have to decide about uh, admissions and uh, medicine and uh, uh, not voluntary uh, admissions and so on. So. Thank you, and I also like. Um the conclusion because there was a song by the Bugles, uh, Radio Kill, the Radio Star, that I still can see that uh, the Radio Star are able to still live on using telephone now. So this combination of all the new technology is still working. And that's, uh, I think that's the, that's the best way of, of introducing new technologies. Just keep a, a look at the old ways of doing it. And telephone is probably more mobile than video conference still, yeah. although video conference on all that phones. No, I'm not sure, maybe I can ask my answer, but we discussed how we could have mobile, have a video conference with them, uh, going around to the GP office or to the home, but they don't have to start with that. Christian um, Ruvik, uh, head of the department, uh, E mastering, E mastering, if I try to pronounce it in English, 
health, health uh, barrier, I guess, it's a municipality or who can, uh, but uh, I give uh, the floor to, to Christine, who's going to talk about the mainstream and intronaut technology and mental health care services, or mental health services, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I come from Bergen, it's in the western part of Norway. Um, let's uh, find my presentation. not always easy with technology, <laughs> even if this is what I do. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm head of a EMS Trinomia clinic, and uh, we um, do ICBT, it's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, over internet. psychiatry and technology. The main reasons is uh, the challenging challenges we see uh, regarding mental health services in Norway today. Uh, we know that people with mental health services, such as anxiety disorders, depression and problematic drinking, uh, has these problems for many years without seeking help. And when they seek help, they do not always get the help that they need. There's also a lot of costs uh, with these uh, people going for so many years with these uh, illnesses. Um, people tend to fall out of work, they become dependent on social care, and they die approximately 20 years earlier than the average population. Uh, to increase help seeking behavior, and to increase access to psychological treatment, we need to be present at the different interfaces common to the population. In Norway, we have a close relation to our iPhones. Uh, we visit our banks online and listen to music, and we have extended our learning services to internet platforms and streaming services. Um, the Western uh, like this, yes. Um, the Western healthcare region uh, from which I come has a strategy on future healthcare services towards 2035. It states that the patient shall not meet at the hospital if they can get equally good treatment at our virtual healthcare services. And this is where MI3 comes in. We are uh, today actually a virtual health healthcare service in uh, the western part of Norway. Um, the MS3 clinic uh, began operating in April 2013 at the Haukland University Hospital after three successful ICBT trials using material developed at Uppsala University and Linköping University in Sweden. Um, the clinic was initially funded as a project uh, by national, regional and local health authorities. Uh, so we had a broad support. Haukland um, <coughs> University Hospital provided specialists, outpatient and inpatient psychiatric care and added the ICBT clinic as part of routine care. Uh, in 2015, 
uh, two further hospitals in Norway at the EMI Stream Clinic as part of their routine care. And we intend to set up ICBT clinics in all regional healthcare regions once we have finished an ongoing upgrade on our software platform. Um, information about our clinic is available uh, at the hospital website uh, at emistream.no and on our Facebook page. The patients can learn about the clinic via their GP uh, or a therapist. And nearly 1,000 patients have received ICBT at the Bergen EMI Stream Clinic since 2013. Um, initially, all patients coming to EMI Stream have to have had to have a referral from their GP. Uh, however, after testing this in a research project, uh, we opened up um, the opportunity for patients in 2018 to contact the clinic directly for telephone screening. And I was listening to you from Scotland earlier today uh, with um, problems getting um, people to uh, participate and, uh, and when we opened up for self-assessment, as they call it in Sweden and in Australia, uh, we got a 200% uh, increase in, uh, in uh, patients. So it was very... People know what they suffer from, and when they find uh, online, they Google who can help me, and then they contact you directly, instead of going to the GP and having a referral, and wait, and wait, and wait, and... So that was a success for us. Um, the three industry clinics uh, offer a guided ICBT to adults with panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and mild and moderate depression. The programs uh, we offer today have eight to nine modules and are delivered over 14 weeks. As in Sweden, Patients attend a face-to-face -face diagnostic assessment to de determine suitability <coughs> and to receive information about therapist-guided ICBT as an alternative to face-to-face -to -face treatment. A face-to-face -face treatment is also scheduled after treatment. If the patient is in need of other forms of treatment, uh, they are offered this at the hospital. Uh, during treatment, uh, the patients receive therapist gui guidance once or twice a week via a um, secure treatment platform, which we have developed uh, together with a private uh, company called Checkware. <laughs> MI stream therapists include uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and nurses. Uh, today we have 10 therapists working one or uh, between one and three days uh, per week and th the rest of the, the days they work in ordinary uh, polyclinic, ordinary therapy. Um, symptoms of their primary disorder are measured weekly uh, using a disorder specific patient report outcome measure. With those symptoms, outcomes and satisfaction assessed less frequently. We also have suicidal assessment every week. Um, there's a six month follow up and uh, the first five year follow ups will start at, uh, in early uh, 2019. Um, as I said, we are working on a new platform together with uh, our software <coughs> company. Uh, and I will show you a few slides from this new platform, which is not uh, released, so this is uh, just for uh, sneak a peek. <laughs> this is uh, how it will look like for uh, the patients in our new platform. At the left hand side, you see uh, information with um, with uh, CBT, ordinary CBT, uh, information about the, the um, depression, this is from the depression program, 
and uh, after the right hand side you see hand side you see the assessments um, for uh, this is at the beginning of the uh, treatment. Um, on top you have the Nelia, this is the messaging system where um, the patient can write message to the therapist. The, each patient gets a therapist who follow them through the treatment and they communicate only by messages in, in this uh, system along uh, the 14 weeks of treatment. We have a, a secure platform with the highest security level, which is four in Norway, um, bypass and bank ID. So it's, uh, it's a secure platform. And, and this is the, the start, the start of page for the therapist, where uh, you can um, access your patient list. You can um, see how many uh, patients have uh, sent your messages and uh, how many patients uh, has uh, the, the enough, uh, has finished their uh, work in, in uh, each module and uh, are waiting to to get the decision to move forward in the treatment. about the messaging system. We do not have a video conference. There's a, bit, a lot of talk about video today. Uh, we, uh, our, we have um, a lot of uh, good experience with, uh, with, the, uh, write, with writing uh, the messages. Uh, it seems to meet uh, another kind of population who is not comfortable with uh, sitting together with a therapist or uh, is uh, someone who's after writing than uh, speaking vocally um, and it gives both the uh, patient and therapist time to think and to um, reflect on what is written earlier um, so it gives a good uh, a good history uh, during the treatment what uh, what did we talk about last week? Oh, here it is. I can read it. That's um, an advantage. Um, so far we have published results on the panic disorder and social anxiety disorder treatments, as well as a benchmarking study on our depression uh, treatment. Um, the results show that in the panic disorder treatment, 57% experience significant change, 72.3 are treatment takers and 85% will recommend the treatment to a friend. In the social anxiety treatment, 66% um, shows significant change, 62.2 are treatment takers and 75% will recommend the treatment to a friend. And this we think is good results. And people always ask, uh, how is it compared to ordinary care? And we don't know a lot about that because ordinary care does not measure this as, uh, as much as we do. But we think uh, it's good. <laughs> then I'll tell you a little bit about the Intromat project. Um, Intromat, and it's from the Emerson Clinic, uh, Tine Nordgren, um, who is a psychologist, uh, led the Emerson Clinic from research project to routine care. She is a mother of Emerson, as we call her. Uh, now she's moved on to a project manager for the Intromat project, um, whose vision is to improve mental health with innovative ICT. And based on the experiences from EmaiString, uh, they realized that they needed um, a closer collaboration with health services and the ICT service expertise. Um, 
because when we had developed, we were uh, they were developing the email stream uh, together with a software company. We had a lot of struggles um, understanding each other's language and so on. Um, what barriers uh, for use of technology supported treatment in mental health institutions do we fight today? Uh, there's a lack of recognition of ICT as an approach to health assessment and treatment. Uh, there's a lack of knowledge about its impact on health. There's a lack of integration between existing ICT systems. There's a lack of user-friendly and engaging interfaces. And there's a lack of innovative procurement arrangements. So, we are struggling at a lot of different uh, areas to, to get uh, more use of technology. Uh, to overcome these barriers, Intramat invited industry, healthcare professionals, users and researchers to sit together during development and testing. And this is done to better understand each other's needs and possibilities. In the Intramat project, they will examine validity and clinical effect of all technology developed within the project. Um, the project started in 2016 and lasts until 2021. Uh, as you see, uh, they have research partners from Eastern and Western Norway at the University of Bergen and the University of Oslo. Uh, they have a lot of industry partners from small startup companies like Explorable and to large international companies like IBM and Tello. Um, and in the West, we are very lucky to have the Helse West ICT, Helse West IKT in Norwegian, uh, who is a strong and important partner in the consortium. And all these partners work together in uh, developing these uh, treatments in Intramat. And this is the five cases they work on. Um, they illustrate the need for psychological interventions across the lifespan and across the traditional somatic psychiatry borders. We have job-focused training for depression in adults, we have relapse prevention for bipolar disorder. We have cognitive training in ADHD. And we have psychosocial support for women recovering from gynecological cancer. And last but not least, in this forum, we have early intervention and treatment for social anxiety disorder in adolescents. Um, and, and as you are from this cap uh, category, I will show you a little, uh, tell you a little bit about the social anxiety case. Um, in the social anxiety case, as we call it, uh, we are developing or internet are developing uh, safe environments for kids uh, aged 13 to 15 who is afraid of doing presentations in front of their class. Um, the project is creating a virtual classroom, which you see uh, behind the girl. Uh, and they are using VR technology of their glasses to expose of their fear. And they, they are actually <coughs> working together with the kids uh, from schools in Bergen um, to, to make it different kind of situations. This is uh, an ordinary classroom setting and they have uh, sitting in a smaller group set, uh, setting. So they, um, and the kids uh, come in and they uh, give feedback to the project and then uh, the, the system, um, the software company is uh, making changes and um, it's really an interaction between the, the users and the, the software company and the psychological researcher. Um, so when using 
technology, we can come close to our patients, we can create a relationship independent from time and place, like we do in, in my stream. The patient can, can write messages to us while sitting and crying in the middle of the night and express how they feel right now. They don't have to wait until Wednesday at <coughs> um, We meet online, the patients can bring their therapeutic space and alliance with them at all time on their mobile units. Um, in our aim to improve mental health care, we have to overcome language barriers, which we have had a lot of in uh, cooperating with the technology industry. We have to fit new technology into existing standards, like medical records. I uh, have to think about healthcare region uh, organizations and so on. Uh, we have to try to change the standards to fit new technology. Uh, for example, we, we do not get um, paid like we do in ordinary psychological care in industry. Um, we get almost nothing, so it's, it's just, uh, what do you say, voluntary work, almost. Uh, but we are working on that. Uh, we are challenging financial framework. Um, for example, who is going to cost this technology development? And we have to raise the level of knowledge about the quality of our treatments among students and professionals in healthcare services, uh, in the general population and among politicians. So we have a lot of uh, things to work on. <laughs> um, we believe that the Imastream Clinic, in close collaboration with patients, healthcare services in general, researchers in IT industry, have the potential to bridge the gap between these domains with the common goal to improve access to effective psychological interventions. Uh, this was a short uh, glimpse of my string in Intramont. Thank you very much for uh, introducing us to a new way of uh, using um, healthcare, I wouldn't say healthcare technology, I would say technology. Mm -hmm healthcare uh, organizations and also how they um, um, are more like social uh, entrepreneurs, uh, monetary, doing a lot of work. I understand it. Very interesting. Is there any comments, questions? Again, um, about, yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm really impressed by what you're doing in Bergen, I must say. You have a real a virtual clinic, uh, which is what we are longing for here. Um, I was wondering if you could say a few things about the, um, the um, um, platform uh, and the capabilities with the platform communicating with your electronic patient journal. How does that work? Um, this is one of our uh, not so good sites. Um, we are currently at a very uh, old uh, platform, which we, the same one as we started in, in 2013, but we are working on an upgrade. Uh, so uh, at our current Platform. We are uh, doing double, double uh, <coughs> documentation. Thank you. <laughs> we are we are writing uh, weekly reports in, in the patient journal. Um, in the, in the future, we hope to, to get this more automatic. Um, we are uh, at the new the new platform. Uh, 
from Czechware. This is another region specific. Um, they are uh, having this automatic EA done. But uh, there's also work uh, being done at the Health of Us ICT with the robotization and the more uh, automatic uh, transferring from this um, patient system and over to the platform. So it's not it's kind of manual <laughs> today. Thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to introduce a person that I never met before, but I heard about. My colleagues have mentioned him before. His name is uh, Peter Bauer Branzek, Chief Researcher Center. And I think he's going to tell us about new ways or ways of using new technologies in uh, healthcare. I'm looking forward to listening to you. Thank you. Last year, together with the University of Agder, University of uh, the University Hospital in Oslo, and the University in Oslo, and uh, Sintef is leading the project. And uh, Sintef is a large research institute <coughs> in Trondheim and Oslo, and we are financed by the Research Council in Norway. And we use also data providers, <coughs> that is question and answering services online to young people. So, how many of you have uh, used a chatbot? Two people. Three. <laughs> Four maybe. <laughs> The yeah, chatbot is often integrated in uh, private messaging uh, services. But what are really chatbots? I don't know if uh, you know that, but um, it's a lot of us about chatbots. So we can ask a chatbot what are a chatbot? Bonjour. How would you describe the term bot to your grandma? My grandma is dead. All right, thank you for the feedback. So we are not always very intelligent. But a lot of um, um, chief uh, officers around uh, uh, dealing with the high tech, such as Satya Nadella, that are the Microsoft CEO, he tells that bots are the new apps. So we can forget about apps and talk about bots. For example, here in Keek, which is a service online, first there were websites, then there were apps, now there are bots. And we also see that in some uh, government services <coughs> that they are starting to include chatbots as an interface to the population. So we have here the old way of communicating by using the search engine and typical uh, here you can push that uh, health 
technical stuff, cultural, school, etc., which can be difficult to, to find. So that's why it's more easy maybe to talk to Kari, which is the chatbot for Sandefjord Kommune. Here I have asked about what can I, how can I get help about uh, psychological health, and then Kari tells me where I can receive that kind of help. So, the more formal definition of chatbots are that chatbots are machine agents that serve as natural language user interfaces for data and service providers online. So this is the typical interface for a chatbot. It's text dialogue in natural language. So, if we go back in time, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. So this was uh, the reasoning for being a human, I'm thinking. And later on, in 1950, Turing, have you heard about Turing? He says that I propose to consider the question, can machine think? So he was aiming for a machine that could think. And in 1989, IBM also had a commercial slogan. I think, therefore, IBM. I don't know if you remember that. But uh, there is a kind of uh, revolution going on in machine learning which may create a new age of reasoning that machines is actually thinking. So, Going back to the internet, in uh, 2006, we were elected at the person of the year in Time Magazine. You'll maybe remember that, but you were actually on the front page of Time Magazine. Because we were creative and we were content producers of the internet. But now this is changing because machines are now the new content producers. So, <clears throat> maybe next year or in a couple of years, machines will be the biggest content producers online. Bigger than humans. So machines are creative and content producers. There has uh, recently been an election in Sweden on Sunday, and uh, it was 60 percent, uh, now 60,000 bots on Twitter that was producing content all the time about the election. <coughs> so a lot of this was also fake, so this is a huge problem. So technology is changing from being a tool to being your partner. I don't know if a lot of people have Google Home or Alexa at home. Do some of you have that? I have Google Home. Google Home is this uh, on the left over there. And uh, this summer was really hot in uh, Norway. And uh, Google Home, you can ask Google Home about it. Anything. And uh, I was uh, in my bedroom sleeping with my uh, younger son, 12 years old. He got up, couldn't sleep because it was so hot. And he was asking you, you know, how can I sleep? It's so hot. 
And Google Home said, just calm down, and I will play some calm music for him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was quite satisfied with that answer, and I got uh, to sleep. So, technology is now your partner, and even in Saudi Arabia, robots are getting citizenship. Not even women in Saudi Arabia have a citizenship. <laughs> so, this is quite uh, crazy. On uh, Facebook, we see more and more chatbots coming up. In 2016, it was 11,000. Now it's uh, almost 200,000 chatbots. Uh, that you can access. Most of them are actually free. We had a recent study about why people use chatbots and time and productivity is the main reason because you get fast response. And then it's entertainment and then it's actually social, that there is a social component in using uh, chatbots that you feel lonely and you can talk to a chatbot. So, then chatbots may also be used as a school nurse or a psychologist. We know that there is an enormous gap between the need for help in mental health and the capacity to help. This is stated in several reports all over the world, and uh, you all know that. And in Unge Norge, which is an um, extremely big investigation on the use in Norway that is uh, going year after year, finds that uh, the share of depressed youth have increased steadily since 1992. And uh, one investigation published uh, last week state that one of every fifth student in higher education in Norway is thinking serious about taking suicide. So, access to health and access to health information and access to mental health information is very important. Helsesister, some of you in Norway might have heard about Helsesister that are targeting young people through Snapchat. Why did she start with that? Yes, because one day in office, as a health nurse in Oslo, she found on her table, Helsesister er jeg bare hver gang det er fullmåne. The health nurse is only accessible once a month. And that was so depressing, so she found out that, okay, should I be able to uh, meet and help all the young people that need help? I need to be more accessible. So, she started a Snapchat uh, account that now has I think uh, 30,000 followers or something, which is quite uh, big in Norway. And this is of course because young people are always on. They use Snapchat in particular, they use Facebook, they use Instagram, they use the mobile phone four to six hours a day. And we see a bedroom culture uh, where youth turn to the internet for health information. They turn to Google or they turn to Instagram. And do you think young people get okay health advices at Instagram? Or Google? <laughs> we all now Donald Trump and his uh, is always saying fake news, fake news. But this is fake news is not only in politician. Fake news is all also in health information. 
fake news in regard to health information is a huge problem. And uh, young people might be uh, in particular vulnerable. <clears throat> Um, so, one reasoning for actually developing chatbots targeting young people to give them mental health advices is that they should get more easy access to verified health information. So, <clears throat> what do you young people ask about online. This is uh, an analysis of all the questions that young people have uh, asked on ung.no, uh, young uh, uh, big uh, answer uh, and uh, question and answer page uh, online uh, that are posted by Barne ungdom så familiedirektoratet, the child and adults and director, no, what do you call it? <laughs> yeah, something for young people, hosted by the government. <laughs> um, but we see that uh, young girls are in interested in uh, everything related to law. Uh, education, uh, feelings, body, their school, uh, everyday school thing, sex, friendship, school, work. And this is uh, law issues. Interestingly, this is more interesting for boys that might be criminals. But um, then you have that, uh, so it's a lot of things young people are asking about on these uh, sites. Uh, one example related to law is this. This is a modern uh, problem. Should I choose gaming or girlfriend? <laughs> So, he is uh, asking, uh, uh, my girlfriend has uh, broken up and uh, the problem is that I have to end the gaming if uh, she will get me back. So, should I really stop gaming? That's the problem. And Young people, this is of course not uh, the worst uh, <laughs> dilemma you can uh, get, but it's an example of the site and the questions uh, inside these uh, sites that we are using for machine learning in developing chatbots. Um, and they get then verified answerings from uh, health personnel in uh, Norway. And uh, this can take maybe one week or maybe two weeks, which is uh, too slow for young people. And we also know that humans open up when they talk to a screen rather than a human. And this is one chatbot, Mitsuku. Uh, have you heard about Mitsuku? Mitsuku is the most human-like chatbot that exists on this planet. So you can search up uh, Mitsuku and start talking with Mitsuku. Mitsuku is uh, the winner of the Logner Prize Turing Test. Turing Test is uh, how human-like a chatbot can be. So this is the most human-like uh, chatbot. So I asked Mitsuku, can you be my school nurse? Only if you download me 
to your computer. Okay, and then you will be my nurse. Yeah, okay, that is a flattering offer. What kind of question can you help me with? I can help you with anything. Just ask me a question. Oh, that's fantastic, Mitsuku. <laughs> Uh, I'm bullied at school, I don't want to go there, what to do? And then Mitsuki responds. Have you told someone in authority? They may be able, able to help you. I would advise that you let someone know before it gets out of hand. Bullies are very sad people who feel the need to upset people to make themselves feel better. They are often very lonely people, really, and only do it for attention. Even so, you shouldn't worry about it. You should tell someone about it as soon as possible. Maybe you should try talking to someone about this. It's quite impressive. This is a computer program uh, giving uh, quite uh, confident uh, advices. Okay. Who should I talk to? I ask. And then suddenly Mitsuki is saying twice the Simpsons. Who? Angelina Dolly? I mean, Simpsons? Uh, I will tell about the bullying to Angelina Dolly. What kind of reply do you expect? I feel sad. And then Send in the clouds. The other side of me. What make you sad? Then he starts bullying me. <laughs> and then, did I say something wrong? Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I thought you should help me as a school nurse. Why do you think I should help me as a school nurse? Because you said so. I say a lot of silly things. <laughs> Okay, but there are some uh, more confident uh, chatbots out there. The Wobot. Have you heard about the Wobot? Wobot is maybe the world's first chatbot that offers a non-stop cognitive behavioral therapy service. So you can download that on uh, Apple or Android or on uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, so, Wobot is developed by Stanford University and sends 2 million messages to users in more than 135 countries, which is quite impressive. And it's uh, of course available 24 7. So, this is, <clears throat> would you like to share some? more with me about the feelings, I guess. Okay, write more about your feelings. Depressed? Is there anything else you would like to share with me? Yay. Okay, write below. Nobody to talk. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure you had enough time to reflect on your feelings, etc. etc. So, but this is like having a therapist in your pocket because Robot will ask you every day how things are going. Uh, in the project we have developed Umbot. Uh, Umbot is in uh, Usebot is in uh, Norwegian. So uh, that's the tricky part for you not uh, understanding in Norwegian. I am Umbot. Uh, on the way, you can be a personal uh, If you want, I can be your personal assistant. Uh, I can tell you things that are useful for you being young. I have been reading everything on youth.no. Think more than 100,000 questions and answers about being young. So then we are, in a way, having a friendly intro. <clears throat> and then, because this is about designing a conversation, in a way. 
Uh, you can ask about anything. Uh, hmm. bare, uh, bare prøv, just try, try and use your own words. Why do I have to go to school? Uh, and then, umbot is finding a topic, school, uh, related to the um.no page. Are you uh, sick and tired of school? Here it is. So then, topic prediction, topic suggestion, content suggestion, content showing, next step. And further on, we are trying to establish a relationship. <coughs> I have told you that I can be your personal assistant. Uh, and now later on, we ask if they are interested to get messages uh, or that they are getting uh, follow-up messages uh, on the same time uh, the day after. <clears throat> so this is one uh, prototype we have, but we have also a prototype on <coughs> using uh, machine learning. It's still not that uh, accurate, because uh, here a boy is asking, uh, having uh, sex with his girlfriend, and how can I make that girlfriend more confident? And the machine is asking, just use a condom. And <laughs> <coughs> so, it's not 100%. Uh, but if you go through, this is not easy to read, you don't have to read it either. But it's uh, as Summary, all chatbot research related to intervention, psychological intervention. intervention. Uh, and what is interesting is that this table demonstrates that uh, these studies and uh, participants that have been into these studies are using the chatbot very often. So, it's a quite uh, engaging interface to these kind of services. And there is either no uh, adverse effect using chatbots, but it's provide quite positive results, promising results. For example, one vote. Uh, they show in a study that it's uh, quite well uh, results on depression. I love Volvo so much, I hope we can be friends forever. I actually feel super good and happy when I see that I remember it. Check in with me. So, <clears throat> how can we make chatbots? Of course we need data. We need a lot of data. And we need good data, so the data quality is very important. Uh, Thai was a bot that uh, Microsoft tried to develop for young people, for young girls, and they uh, were thinking that Twitter was an excellent space, they had excellent data that could train this uh, bot. But uh, in uh, 20 hours, I was turning into a feminist hater and a Nazi. I fucking hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell. So the data quality is extremely important when developing chatbots. So in that regard we are quite lucky that have a lot of data quality in Ung.no and Karakuluk that can help us in training the chatbots. So, in conclusion, 
Chatbots is the new conversational way to approach young people in mental health problems by the use of AI. Good training data are key in developing chatbots. Chatbots are promis promising both as an information partner but also as an intervention tool. But there needs, of course, a lot of more empirical research, also long-term research, to see the effects of the use in regard to chapels, also in regard to user experience factors, privacy, etc. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving us a, a look into the, maybe some would say bright future, <laughs> others would say uh, dark future, and um, I'd like to invite you to comment, ask questions about this chatbot. First. Thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation, Peter. I have a question regarding the chatbots, they ask a lot of questions, but uh, a difficult thing for the, for the chatbot is to discover what person really needs the help. When does the alarm sound and you have the, the, the next line of, of intervention, do you have a, a, a kind of a, a emergency Helpline from from the real, uh, from mental health institutions, hospitals. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because there is a lot of ethical issues coming up when uh, you have the machine in charge. And can the machine actually detect if these people are, or the, if this human are really down and maybe it's Suicidal. Uh, so um, uh, then we train uh, the data in regard to, uh, for example, suicide uh, issues. If this is coming up as a topic, it will be a kind of an alarm button that are in the network with the chatbot. So the chatbot will be part of a network of people. Yeah. Great. First, thank you very much for a nice presentation and I'm very happy that you, you keep it very balanced uh, with this new technology, both the possibilities and the great challenges. So thank you for that. Um, two questions. How far have you come uh, you are working with Clara Klug and, and the chatbot is, uh, is uh, learning from all the answers that the professionals have, as I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you uh, tried it in some type of trial with, with young people yet, or where are you at? We, we have uh, 16 young people now, between 16 and 20. Yeah that uh, have this uh, umbot yeah. and I am interviewing them about their experience related to having that and okay. they are uh, so far very positive because mm -hmm. they feel that they uh, learn more about themselves by talking to both uh, the robot mm -hmm. because they have also access to the robot and the umbot all right. So, so these young people, they're not a patient group? They no, are, they are not clinical just, uh, okay. people. Right. They are uh, only young people that are struggling with uh, divorced parents or mm. Mm. Okay. more normal things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about moving it into the clinical setting? Uh, what would be the the steps to take there. Do you have you discussed that? Uh, we are mainly targeting the light mm. group, the ordinary young people, uh, yeah. to to uh, help 
having a more early intervention yeah. related to uh, if they have problems with depression, uh, maybe a chatbot can urge the young people to actually get help faster. Yeah. yeah. So early intervention, that kind, would be... Yeah, a... kind of an early yeah, intervention. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, do you think, is there a way to prevent a chapel from changing a misogynazi? To, to prevent the chatbot to, to change bad, uh, this uh, anti-feminist Nazi. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's all about the data quality, the, uh, the data you feed the chatbot. So, so you, so so you, this yeah. data, the Thai uh, chatbot that turned into a Nazi. So it's, a, it's, a, it's about uh, to owning the data and uh, understanding how to use the training data. Yeah, the training data needs to be, in a way, verified beforehand. You have to go through the data, and the data should be in what, uh, uh, the danger of using Twitter, that is an open, dynamic space, yes. where people can also troll, be trolling the chatbot, what was happening here. But so far you don't have the fear about uh, the machine uh, learning uh, creating itself uh, uh, harming. Uh, yeah, you can control this quite well, okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess it would be uh, the data machine controlling the data again, the new data. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but when I uh, was in the seventies in the university, I read about an article about a machine called Eliza. Eliza was stupid. She just asked very general questions. How do you do? And uh, he answered, or she answered. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And um, actually, the people felt more open to the machine than they did to the psychiatrists. Yeah, but so they come a long way since, since <laughs> Eliza, I can tell. Yeah, they, this is more advanced than Eliza. Yes. Eliza was uh, not based on uh, machine learning. No, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Thank you very much for... Uh, Thank you for coming. And uh, would you like to say something in the end? Then I have to say something. We <laughs> <laughs> learned about the Bermuda Triangle. So it is about technology, organization, and uh, humans. And um, maybe they should be equally important. Or if you learn today that the machines are becoming more and more important. Uh, but the good services uh, should be balanced. Uh, both uh, technological issues, and actually we still have a long way to go. And um, also balance the, the organization, or how we organize uh, the services. And we all come back to the, the human factor should be the most important, of course. But we need tools and uh, organizations and, 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 and technology is, is tools. Um, sometimes uh, the organization becomes more important than the human beings, but um, we only have to try to make a good, good triangle, a living triangle. <laughs> no, I talk a lot of rubbish, but uh, <laughs> this is the end of the, the conference today. And uh, uh, I say goodbye to our invited guests, and uh, I thank all the speakers, and uh, the rest of us will uh, continue the conference um, tomorrow. Help yeah, we'll, we'll start uh, working tomorrow. Thank you very much.